and other places, right, yeah. all over yeah. California to discuss how they are working with um, transition age youth. Alrighty, so you guys want to introduce you. yourselves? Yes. Well, like I said, here your evaluation sheet. We'll put them at the back. Okay. Thank you. All right. All right. All right. So my name is Joy. Uh, thank you all for humoring me this morning. Um, I am California Youth Connections Mental Health Project Coordinator. Um, have folks heard of California Youth Connection? Okay. Um, I'll let everybody else uh, introduce themselves, and then I'll give a little elevator speech about California Youth Connection. Good morning, everyone. My name is Dana. I'm on the most big and no very board, um, and I also go to USC for social work. Good morning, everyone. My name is Ricardo. Um, I am from LA, and um, I'm the mental health administrator. Good morning, everybody. My name is Malaysia, and I am also from the LA chapter of the Mistake Thank you. So this morning, um, we're going to share a little bit about how we're working towards a new stigma around mental health, but then also answer some questions and kind of have a community dialogue with each other. Um, about how you can best support young people, or if there's any questions or challenges you're having right now, um, then we can help navigate and problem solve since we're here in person. Does that sound good for folks? Good morning, y'all. Actually, congratulations, y'all are up so early and ready. Um, so snaps to that. You guys look wonderful. I know, y'all are all awake. Um, so, and I do snaps to show support um, if something's challenging for um, anyone, or if I'm really feeling or supporting something, I'll snap um, and show encouragement. So I, I encourage y'all throughout our process this morning, um, if you are really feeling it, um, if you want to support and say I see you, you can snap and show solidarity with us. Um, so this morning, I'm going to give y'all the rundown of an elevator speech for CYC. And the packets that you have, um, I'm going to grab one to just show y'all what's in here. So if I forget to mention anything, um, there you should be able to find it in your packet. On the left, on y'all's, this side, <laughs> this paper, um, it talks a little bit more about the California Connection as an organization and what we do. Um, we're a 30-year organization. Um, all across the state supporting current and former foster youth um, to develop leadership skills. Um, there's this undertone of wellness and community that's being built. Uh, and we believe, I'm a former member of California Youth Connection, um, and I'm a firm believer that community helps us get through some of the toughest times. Um, and we, facilitate that both locally and statewide, which is beautiful. Um, we have chapters all across the state, up in Humboldt, all the way down to San Diego. Um, is everyone in here local, or y'all are from everywhere? Okay, who's from Northern? Like, oh, welcome. What counties? Mendocino. Oh, cool, me. All right. Um, we have chapters near Mendocino right now. What about kind of central? What counties are y'all from? San San okay. Stanislaus. Stanislaus, yes. Fresno. Fresno. Oh, I didn't connect with all y'all. Um, <laughs> what about the area? Okay. What counties? San Mateo. San Mateo? Alameda. Alameda. I don't know if I saw your hand. What county are you from? Um. Bay Area. Bay Area, okay. Um, I'm a local Bay Area person. Um, I grew up in Alameda County, uh, and now I'm, well actually I'm still in Alameda County, I'm in Livermore. <laughs> um, but our young people are from all across the state on the board. Um, and the Mental Health Board, we work towards ending stigma. It's a really cool project that we got funded through Mental Health Services Act money. Um, do y'all know what that is? It's Prop 63, and there's a, like a cheat sheet in your folder, too, so if I forget to mention anything. Um, so, Mental Health Services Act uh, was to create, well, how we're involved in the Mental Health Services Act is there's this 
governing body called the Mental Health Services Oversight Accountability Commission. Um, and they provide grants for innovative projects to help consumers and communities. Um, and we are part of the TAY like bucket. Um, we're in our third year of our contract and um, it's pretty exciting. But they're the overseers. Uh, we're helping do research, advocacy, outreach, trainings. Um, and if y'all have questions later, I, I can answer those. But I want to get into our kind of panel discussion. Um, do y'all want to pull a chair? Do y'all cool standing? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll. Okay. <laughs> so, um, we're going to get comfortable. A part of our culture in the organization is making sure um, we have a youth-friendly environment. Um, and so that's what I'm giving space for right now. Um, normally we would have, a, I was going to stereotype kumbaya culture. <laughs> um, and I went to school in Santa Cruz, so I consider myself a hippie sometimes. Um, but we normally want to have uh, more closer knit conversations, and so. Um, but now I'm going to hand it off to y'all. Um, so the first question I have for the group is: um, What does support look like for you? Um, and to be thinking back about in school, what does it look like, and even in your current life? <laughs> okay, so for me, as a creative person and as an artist, support for me looks like encouragement. It looks like, I don't say support, but overall, that energy of I can help you do it, you can do it, not necessarily trying to impose on what I'm trying to do, but more so uplift and try to maximize it to the best of both of our abilities or however many you know, people, group that I'm involved with. So for me, support is, it's not something physical, it's more so of action. And it doesn't necessarily need to be physical action, but um, I hope that makes sense. <laughs> so in a nutshell, that's what support looks like for me. Um, for me, support uh, is kind of like a mentor that I can go for um, and ask for guidance. Um, I think that's something that is very important for me um, since I was in the, I'm still in the foster care system and in the foster care system, you get a lot of mentors and support, um, but also I was in, in um, getting uh, support through mental health as well. So just someone that I can go and talk to and ask for guidance. Okay. Hi, guys. Um, so I'm going to kind of twist this a little bit, only because I'm going to show you, I'm going to be a little bit personal. So coming up to this conference, my boss shouldn't even attest to it, I was having a little bit of anxiety. So I suffer from anxiety attacks for like 10 years and some change. Um, and so the best support that I can say for myself, um, it would be to just let me be in that space. You know, don't really like ask me super questions. But like, just let me be in that space and let me get those emotions out that I'm feeling because it's not necessarily I'm mad or angry, it's just I'm overflowed. Um, so just allow somebody to just be expressive or just be silent if they need to. Um, or just as Malaysia did, she just put her hand on my back and was like, you're gonna be okay. So like just simple, like it's not really, support's not huge, like a big, huge thing, but it's also little small things too, so. My next question is, what does giving support look like? Okay. <laughs> giving support, in my opinion, is giving someone what they need because we all have different forms of support just as we all have different love languages. So one way that one person may need support isn't necessarily what someone else may need. So I see it as active listening, but then synthesizing it to where you can provide an action or a service to again help that person. So um, it's listening and it's being receptive and putting back out exactly what it is 
that is supposed to be put out because you took that time to internalize it and make sure that the actions were correct. Um, for me, it would just be for that person to just be there and just say, I'm here for you and let all those emotions go out um, and just be there towards the end when his, that person or that child is ready to talk. Um, support, giving support, I would say to meet that person where they're at. Um, everybody is dealing with different stuff and different lifestyles and whatnot. And so having a general support like requirement or like cur curriculum, I feel like would not allow that individual to actually express themselves. So meeting them where they're at and kind of going from their pace and seeing what they need instead of what you can implement into them, if that makes sense. But I think that's what for me. Alright, so I'm hearing a lot of themes around um, individualized, I'm hearing listen, um, active listening, I'm hearing consistency and stability through those supports, um, so I think Ricardo you said at the end, like you're still there. Um, so when we're thinking about advocacy um, in the world that we work in, uh, how do we advocate for support? But then, um, well, what, what does advocacy look like in our world? Because it's so unique. So we'll start off with that. All right. Okay. Um, so advocacy, I would say, as in what we do, for me in particular, I love doing programs. Um, and so with addressing mental health, it's kind of hard to address it without hitting people's triggers. Um, so the programs that I like to, as I was well collaborate with my co co-workers, because those are my colleagues. <laughs> but um, I like those programs to be more active. And so you don't really know what you're doing yet, you're just really having fun expressing yourself. And then at the end of it, this is a mental health project and you didn't even know. And so to have that conversation you being talked about and so you can have that dialogue and, and a safe space to talk about mental health and mental disorders. And so that's kind of my advocacy side of it. Um, my <clears throat> it's a little bit different. Um, I'm more in the policy legislative side. Um, so with mental health, I do a lot of policy uh, work with diff different assembly members. Um, I'm on an immigration commission, so just with that alone, trauma causes a lot of things with families suffering from immigration. So that's something that I go based on. Um, but um, I work with my colleagues on different uh, ways to express trauma. Uh, far more on the policy legislative advocacy side. And um, so overall, CYC and No Stigma, No Barriers, we're really multifaceted in the way that we go about trying to reduce these stigmas, such as workshops and being on the political side. Um, in my recent experience, I definitely do kind of a combination of both. Um, so recently I had the pleasure to attend Riverside's Board of Supervisors, so there's some you know, political side to that but then also facilitating workshops. So I kind of come in with the artistic, holistic uh, kind of side of things. So just really kind of fusing everything that we know, everything that we do into something that we could really deliver to the youth. All right, yeah, so I'm hearing, and how many of y'all have heard of the phrase, it takes a village, right? <laughs> um, yes, okay. Um, not only does it take a village of supporting folks, but it also takes a village of different skill sets, I think, um, to be able to make change. Um, and part of what our organization and my job is, is to be able to get to know folks individually so that they can build up their skills and strengths in specific areas. Because um, how many of y'all like hear about Google and how they have like thousands of employees uh, each of them has like specialized pieces to make Google function. Um, and that's the same thing with advocacy work. Um, oftentimes we see the folks at the front end, um, whether it be like rallies or hearings at the legislator, legislature. Um, but on the back end, there's that healing process um, that's being facilitated so folks can have the courage to be able to go out and advocate to the legislator um, or locally, right? 
Um, and so we kind of get to see a mesh of that here. All right, so my next question for the group um, is, and you can be honest, um, even though I'm a staff person supporting y'all, um, what does effective support look like to make the magic happen? So like, as a staff person, what does that support look like um, so that y'all can do the work that you're doing? <laughs> no, um, for me, there's times that um, support, because I work with many people, um, I have a lot of staff people that I work with, and it's just sometimes there's personalities that crash, especially when you're in the mental health world. There's different characters, different ways of um, addressing different individuals, so um, just when you first meet someone, just to tell them, this is a way that I like, like with my colleagues, I told them I'm not a, mor a morning person, so don't bother me in the morning, don't talk to me in the morning. So I, I, I went straight up and told them, this is what I don't like, um, and I told them these are my triggers, and stuff like that. So just be straight with um, staff, whoever is supporting you. I would say, um, Joy, for one, has been an amazing, amazing job. Um, but something that she allowed was this kind of free space. So when we first all got onto the board, we kind of went to this like retreat, and it was kind of like, don't be ashamed of what you're gonna say, this is you, like, you know, this is how you work, this is how you get through your day, so go ahead and let that be known to the rest of your colleagues so we can learn how to work with you. And I think that was great, but in addition to that, Joy allows you to be you, <laughs> if that makes sense, um, in every aspect. And so she's, at the same time as we're busy, yes, but she knows that we're busy, but she also would hit us up like, hey, um, I know you're doing this, but are you guys on top of this, or what do you feel about this? And so it's like, she's keeping us accountable as well as us making sure we're, of course, supporting her. Um, but I feel like, just make sure it's that open space for your employees or colleagues or whoever to just be able to speak and be themselves and say, hey, this isn't really working for me. It's kind of making me uncomfortable without a fear of judgment. Judgments usually make people not want to speak up for themselves. So that would be my guess. I think effective support, as far as our organization goes, has this um, underlying tone of duality because, just like Dana uh, mentioned, you know, Joy for sure allows us to be us. Like, we, neither of us up here kind of feel like we need to have a filter with ourselves. And that's not to be rude, but it's just like, you're just able to be yourself. And if you can find that tribe or that family that you can do that with, then you've already won. So this just happens to be our open tribe, but you know, your open tribe could be, it can look like something else. So I just think it's openness, it's duality, it's listening and hearing, but also providing that space to like kind of isolate yourself. It's, it kind of, it's all encompassing. So I think that we do a, a pretty effective job of getting things done, but getting things done in our own unique ways that best serve us. Yeah. All right. Um, so the things that, well, as a staff person, I want to share kind of um, my approach to supporting y'all. Um, and they've honestly hit most of it right on point. Um, part of my philosophy is to get to know everyone for who they are. Um, and how many of y'all have ever felt like either in school or in work that you've had to like put on a face or change yourself to be successful in that space? M many folks, right? Um, and I feel like for me, and I'm still struggling with this because I'm trying to uphold my values and how I work with the folks that I work with, but then also trying to be successful in this professional space that we're in. Um, but it's really, and that's part of my advocacy, is really changing the narrative and shifting that we don't have to like fit these boxes um, to be successful because we all bring something to the table. Um, and so a lot of it is on my end as a professional advocating on behalf of my board about like, this is what works for them and so I'm not willing to compromise or force anything upon them, right? Um, and so on the back end, I'm advocating on behalf to make things work 
um, and make it a safe space for everyone. Um, my other philosophy is to be transparent with my young people and to be vulnerable with them too. And so all of them know that I also am a mental health consumer. Um, I also have anxiety. Um, but it helps, at least for me, I think it, it, it encourages y'all to also be vulnerable. If I'm able to say, I've experienced this, um, or I'm going through this right now as well, then we can talk and problem solve together. Um, and there's not, there's not this feeling that we have to struggle by ourselves. Um, because this is our tribe, and this is our community. Um, and then the other piece that I want to touch on is uh, taking time for our mental health and wellness, like being intentional. I can create as beautiful of a space as I want to around um, to have y'all feel well, um, but sometimes it's I need to step back right now for two weeks so I can focus on school and my wellness, right? Um, sometimes it's... Uh, I can't deal with this person's personality right now, um, but once I think about it, we can come back and do a mediation, right? Um, so I just wanted to add on to that. Um, and yeah, I'm really proud of y'all. Um, so is there anything else y'all would like to share with the group before we open it kind of to our open discussion question and answer? Um, I just have a quick question. So I know you guys are, I don't know if it's right or not, uh, but you guys are school psychologists. Um, so I know something that, for me, because I'm still in high school, um, and I'm about to graduate. So I know for a fact that school psychologists are needed, um, especially in um, low-income communities. Um, a lot of our, my, a lot of our students, a lot of our community that I serve and I, and I try to advocate as much as I can, um, they have an issue with how to approach you guys. That's, that's the thing that they have been asking me. How do I approach a school psychologist? Um, because they're older, I don't know if they're gonna understand the situation. Um, so it's kind of uh, trying to find a way to connect with your students or with whoever you serve. That's one of the things that I would like to um, just point out. Uh, and also just to, to respect um, their background their culture, because um, I know something that that um, sometimes their school psychologists who do not understand the culture or do not know how to speak the language. Um, so I would just encourage you guys to kind of be open to them and just let them know that I'm here for you. What's your gender? Um, that's something that I just wanted to put out to the group. I do not want to be rude. I have a class, <laughs> and I, I'm just going to go out and come back in. <laughs> just wanted to let you guys know.
Okay. Uh, well, that's, that's, I think that's great because young people, um, you're where young people are at, um, which is ideal, um, and so it's a safe space. So what is the process? Uh, and I guess this is going to open up because I want to have this dialogue now because I hear similar things that Ricardo is saying. Um, what is your process to bring or encourage young people to join the table and come and talk to you? Because this hopefully could be a dual learning experience. So I'm only a patches up student, but something I see in my class of you and I really like is there's a main stage to the middle school. So usually in the morning, instead of filling out paperwork, they'll go out there and say hi to all the kids as they're coming. Mm -hmm. um, and then on Fridays when he has a little bit more leeway, if he has a little bit more leeway, he'll switch out his shoes and go play basketball with the kids. Okay. And he really enjoys that. I like that. Now I'm not a sporty person, but I'd be willing to go out during like lunch or break or something. Yeah, I like that. Um, that is something I hear sometimes uh, around, in what county, or, because we kind of did. Uh, Tulare County. Um, is that Central-ish um, Valley, or is that? Near Fresno. Oh, yeah, okay. All right, are y'all both from Cool Beans? Welcome. Um, that was something uh, a group I was working with was talking about, it's like, the school counselor, the school social worker is always in this office, right? And it's like daunting. Sometimes it's in the back. You know, schools are all different. Um, but one of the things was the connections that they have are with the security guards that do see them during breaks, right? Or uh, other admin staff. And so I think that's a really good method of encouraging and building that rapport. Um, so when there is a situation, young people feel comfortable because they've already seen you. They already know, and it doesn't have to be basketball. Maybe it is like bring some cookies to lunch, right, or something. <laughs> Food is a winner. Um, I do have a, I do have a comment on like that question, though. Like as far as like how the subject can school psychologists be for students, mm -hmm. because school psychologists have such like their role is really to impact the students with the most who are most vulnerable, who are most with the most needs. And so to have such an open door can sometimes be hard because you don't have that kind of support availability as well. And so in some larger school districts, if you're lucky, then you have a school counselor or a social worker who's available to do those kind of counseling. But in a smaller school, like where I'm at, as a charter school, so like we don't have that access and availability. Um, and so a lot of times our process is a little more difficult where there is a referral process, there is like this, there are meetings prior to the student being put into counseling. Um, and so when we, when I see students, it's to teach specific like skills that they are lacking and that's why they need the counseling or they need the support that a school site would do or provide. But otherwise, like what I've learned is that students with mental health, because out there, I feel like everyone has some kind of mental health problems. And so one of the biggest support for them is, um, or the biggest resiliency is having a connection with any adults on campus who is not in their home, but like, like the officer or even like the janitor or their own teacher, like that is the best connection for them sometimes because that teacher sees them on a, see them on a daily and you know, um, they understand that the, I mean, there's more connection between yeah. the parents more. So, um, if, you know, so there's more connection sometimes with other, other adults than just the school side. What I wanted to add to your point was um, in our school, in my school, um, they have um, a behavior specialist um, they have a social worker and they have a school counselor. So they have three people in our campus that can support. Now, a lot of the kids don't want to go to them for the same fact that they don't know them. They don't know where their office is at. So um, what I told and I kind of suggested to the three counselors that are supposed to be out there um, was to, okay, you guys don't want to go or the kids don't want to come to you. Then teach the teachers on the way of um, supporting them. And um, <clears throat> something that we learned was that was very helpful because the teachers, they have six teachers and every student has a favorite teacher. So um, target all the teachers and whoever takes it, 
and support that student in different ways and affect that student's life, especially in high school. Yeah, definitely. I mean, even for me, I'm specifically like an instance training for a bunch of teachers of other. So what I told the counselors were, you need to be consistent. You cannot meet with the teachers once a semester and that's it. You need to be consistent with them and kind of update on different things. It's the climate of the school and the community that's going on. You need to be alert on different things that are going on um, so you can get the teacher prepared for different situations. Okay, well, I just want to ask um, a great dialogue, by the way. I wanted to um, kind of shake it all up because that's what I do. So I'm like the unconventional art kooky one, so hey. Um, <laughs> what I'm, um, to kind of comment, uh, what's your name, ma'am? Gaoku. One more time. <laughs> Gaoku. Uh, hello. <laughs> Pleasure to meet you. Um, I wanted to comment on the fact that I heard you mention that um, it's often easier for students to kind of connect with those they see more often, but I think it kind of takes um, an effort, so like, not that it's impossible to start to build those connections, but you want to try unconventional ways. Um, and that's kind of what I specialize in as a non-official like official art therapist, but I consider myself to be an art therapist. Psych was actually my first major, but because of uh, events, we went the art routes, and it is actually full circle, so I'm doing the same thing anyway, just in a different way, in, in a non-linear way, and I think we, can fall victim sometimes to linear thinking, like it can only be this, it can only be this, it can only be this, but you already have a position, what are they gonna do? So I mean, like just kind of find different, fun, unique ways to draw the kids, uh, sorry, not kids, students in, kids are baby goats. Mm -hmm. um, but I know, um, <laughs> you know, I recently, uh, I'm an alumna from Cal State San Bernardino, and one of the things that um, our deans used to do is lunch with the dean, so like, every week or you know something to where kids like students like free food some offer food <laughs> but i just think that we need to shake out of linear thinking and start to really find like as a as a student or as a youth what would draw me in and then put your own spin to it so like even if you uh, feel unapproachable change your wardrobe put a little collar in your hair you don't always have to be the collar you know like we don't have to fit into the box of my time your title is your title, but it's your title for a reason. So do as you wish with that. But I think finding unique, fun, engaging ways would totally solve that problem. I guess um, one of my professors in my program, she was a, she is a school counselor, and one thing that she does that I thought was just amazing, and this started because she was realizing that students didn't even know where her office was. Students didn't even know like goes with breaking down the stigma of because I believe ultimately there's a stigma around counselors and psychologists it's like so tell me about your feelings and you're laying in a chair and it's this daunting process right so I 
that's where it goes back to that creativity, finding a way to be approachable, finding a way to flip it to where students do know. Like, I don't know, have a door decorating contest, then they'll find you. I don't know, something out of the box is what I'm getting at. Um, but I know in my experience, like when I was in high school, I only knew my counselor because I ended up being a TA. And in being a TA, I got behind the scenes access. So like if he was on the phone call, bless Mr. Williams, if he was on a phone call, like I could be there, you know, it wasn't like, just so like that inside information, just kind of like taking someone under your wing, not in a stuffy way. I, I think how that balance works for you is what's gonna be the key. Yeah, so I heard like a, a few different pieces. One, to be creative and try to interact with young people, because there is this like, what I've been hearing and in my own personal experience, if there is a school counselor that's designated to that school, then um, young people don't know where it's at unless there's some kind of crisis that happens. Um, and so, and then, like for me, the first time I realized there was an on-site psychologist or counselor um, was after a suicide happened on our campus and it was over the intercom and said, um, if you need to speak to someone, you can visit the school counselor, you know, and. And I was like, this is halfway through the year. Um, why didn't any of us know? You know? <laughs> um, and then I also heard it's kind of a capacity building thing um, because, and I know for sure, some school districts don't even have one just for one school. They have to share a bunch of schools, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, with your point to, that's a lot to, if we want to be able to help those that are in intense need, um, and we all can't, and even in my role, I have to practice, we have 200 young people as members. I can't give my, I'm an introvert and an empath. <laughs> I, I don't have enough energy to give to 200 people every single day, um, but I can make every interaction special when I do get the opportunity. Um, and then I also rec well, am hearing that it's a cultural change within the schools, and so it shouldn't all be a burden on the school counselors, right? Um, or school psychologists. It should be uh, teachers having the skills and techniques to also support. Um, one of the biggest things um, for, because we do foster youth advocacy and mental health advocacy, one of the biggest things uh, that I hear from all of our members is there's opportunities where all of us can make an impact before there is this huge crisis, right? And so if we, if schools have this culture of teachers all knowing what trauma looks like, and we're all knowing how to not, like to de-escalate a situation, um, then young people might not need such services, you know? Um, and then I'm gonna do a time check, 918. Um, <laughs> What questions do you have for our young people? I did want to say though, um, on that part that you were talking about, um, I know there's pieces of legislation that um, we're looking at and have been on our radar about um, how many, what is the term they use, mental health professional that have oh, to yeah. be on campus. So there's going to be one bill that is on the floor right now in committee um, to decide if 600 students per one professional mental health um, campus person to be in every school. So if you have 12,000, um, 1,200 students in your campus, you're gonna have two professionals to handle those, two, those 600 kids. Yes. So my, my problem that I've been running into with things like that is we have like people on campus, but it's not consistent. Mm -hmm. So students build relationships, like let's say with me, mm -hmm. and so I'm there Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and I have like 700 responsibilities because I'm the school side, I'm the crisis person, I'm everything on those days. Yeah. But then on Tuesdays, Thursdays, there's a different person there. Yeah. So the students, you know, I can't build the same kind of relationships that you can because we're two different people. Yeah. And it may take me a few months to do it with one student, whereas with another, I can do it in minutes. Mm -hmm. yeah. It just depends. And okay. so when there's not that consistency, you know, kids who escalate one day won't escalate the next. And then it's just by, so the, those are the problems that we're running into. So even though we have the ratio sometimes, not all the times, 
it's still not as effective as it could be because of situations like that. Yeah, and I think that's the thing that, um, that's what I brought it up because I know the number is um, something that I thought was 600 students for one person to handle is too much for me. Mm -hmm. um, and I saw another bill also that they were talking about creating um, safety kits for mental health as well to give to the teachers. Mm -hmm. And that way when, like I said, if a student breaks down or has um, something going on in the classroom, they know how to handle it. Um, so there's different legislations that are going off and it's kind of like support one but also do the other one to kind of go together. But I do believe that um, consistency is a big issue, um, especially like if you're in a charter school or if you're in a public school, it's just different things. Um, but I know that the state doesn't want to be regulating local school districts as well. Yeah. And then to touch on that, like this is an opportunity, now that we're hearing some of the barriers y'all have of being um, as supportive or you know whatever the case may be, um, we can advocate on our end to try to amend some of those things. Yeah. Because one of the biggest things uh, in the CYC world side is uh, where, I don't know if you want to talk about the foster system.